right, everybody, welcome to French 101. We. Uh, oui. Yes. Actually, does anybody in here speak French? Okay, then I, am, I ordinarily start, off, start these off with a really terrible joke, and I'm not gonna break the cycle at GDC. Just some of you may not understand this one because it's a bad French joke. That there's two cats swimming across a river. One of them is named one, two, three. The other is named un, deux, trois. Which one makes it to the other side? You're right, one, two, three cat makes it because unfortunately un, deux, trois cat sank. I'm already getting call I'm already getting jeers from up here. They want me <laughs> off the stage. No, this is good. So uh, it's day four, everybody, and I think this is probably an apt panel for day four. Who's feeling? Who's feeling just exhausted? <laughs> okay, okay, hold on. Keep your hands up. Keep your hands up. Keep your okay. For those of you who are feeling exhausted, keep your hands up if you've deliberately said no to things like parties, interviews, etc. Okay, most of you. Okay, that's good. That's good. All right, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna, we have this fantastic panel of industry veterans, and we're gonna talk about how they deal with stress, particularly burnout stress. And hopefully they're gonna have some really great tips for you all to do the same thing. But first, let's talk about, uh, well, who I am and who I'm here with. Uh, my name is Dr. B. I am the clinical director of a mental health nonprofit called Take This. Uh, starting in 2012, we were actually the first mental health nonprofit to serve the game industry. And our whole mission can be boiled down to it's okay to not be okay. And it is a, you know, basically mental health challenges are far more common than we realize, regardless of whether they raise to the level of a full diagnosis or not. And yet we're not talking about it. One of the statistics we like to cite is from the Centers for Disease Control here in the United States, and it's roughly one in four people will be diagnosed in their lifetime. Think about that. And this is actually kind of a conservative number. This number does not include substance abuse disorders. This number does not include neurodevelopmental disorder like Asperger's. Um, but it's still significant. If you don't know someone who suffers from a mental health diagnosis, yeah, you do. Yeah, you do, and they're not talking about it, which is part of the problem. So Take This exists to help bring education to studios, to attendees, and we do a lot of talks like this. And we wanna bring awareness to all of you, and apparently you all are, you're all concerned about burnout, yeah? Yeah. Yeah, because like this industry's hard or something? <laughs> like, totally? Who, 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 who got into this industry with the dreams of I'm gonna make amazing games? I mean, obviously. But, and it's gonna be great, and I'm gonna do it in my spare time, and I'm gonna lead it. I'm already getting laughter as soon as I say spare time. <laughs> yeah, we're gonna talk about that. Um, but, what is burnout? Like, no, seriously, I'm, I'm asking you, what is burnout? Somebody give me a guess, because we use the term all the time, and I wanna make sure we're all on the same page. Yes, you in the back with the red sleeves. So it's when your mind completely and suddenly stops and you cannot think anymore, okay? Who else? Yes. Deep depression. Let's go over to, the, yes. Going 100% for too long to the point where you can't go anymore. 100% for too long to the point that you cannot go anymore. Way back in the corner. Cannot function. Boy, that just, that summarizes it all. Yes. you. Your work starts to become terrible. So you can't think, okay, so. I love that I'm getting such a great response on day four. <laughs> Unless you're all stretching and I just don't know it. Because <laughs> I don't know, you know, drinking, gotta keep that red, never mind. Um, all of you are correct, in part. Burnout is all of these things. It's not, first of all, it's, it's kind of like imposter syndrome. It's not a diagnosis. All right, imposter syndrome isn't actually a syndrome. But burnout is something that is a unique, long-term form of stress that affects our cognition, our ability to think, affects our mood, so D 
deep depression, touches on that. It affects our functioning, and it also affects our career longevity. And incidentally, it has correlates with all of these things. Now part of the reason this is going to be really important for studios, if you are a manager at a studio, big, small, somewhere in between, doesn't matter, pay attention to this because turn, turnover rates are a substantive cost. A statistic that we cited in a white paper uh, that Take This wrote for the IGDA in 2016 called Crunch Hertz uh, cited that the cost, just the cost of retraining a new employee is 20% of their annual salary. That's not to even mention losses in productivity due to retraining time. In the United States alone, productivity costs related to depression were in the $44 billion range per year. So we want to optimize our spaces. And I believe it was the most recent uh, developer satisfaction survey that the IGDA put out that roughly two out of three developers and game industry employees drop by their 10th year. We don't have many veterans in this industry. And we want that because we want that expertise. And so we need to, we need to eliminate this stuff. But since I mentioned crunch, OK, well, uh, again, since you all were in the mood for raising hands or stretching, I don't know. I'm not going to judge. But what happens to burnout if we just work less hard? Yes? So you're probably working just as hard for less amount of time and you feel just as stressed if we just eliminate the work hours. Okay, yes? You start losing momentum if you back off. Okay. And what was that? Benefits you, but your work fails. So what, you know, when you're watching your numbers and you have, you're looking at ratings and all of that, and what happens then? I mean, that's terrifying. Yes? You start to get stressed about what you don't have done. Oh boy, if I had a nickel for every time I heard that one. <laughs> yes? You're less likely to ship if you don't work constantly. You read our paper, seriously. <laughs> Actually, uh, over, oh, studios who regularly use crunch, ha, there is a correlation with lowered Metacritic scores. Yeah. Yes? Okay, so, there, so there's fear. There's fear of a lack of progress in your career because your peers and your superiors are going to be looking down on you if you work less hours. Well, what happens to burnout? Yes? Guilt. Oh boy, we were, we're opening up a whole can of worms. Didn't know this was going to turn into group therapy, did you? <laughs> yes. So we hear negativity about self, negativity about work, guilt, fear. Yes. So to summarize this, burnout's a form of depression, and you work harder to beat the depression, but then you get more depressed about working hard, and your work's not as good, because you can't think as straight, and whew, Okay, no one else has experienced that, right? <laughs> okay, well, let's, let's talk about why it's not just a simple matter of working less hours, and you're all touching on this. Because burnout is not just a matter of exhaustion. Sure, burnout, Exhaustion is a part of it, but it's not the only part, okay? There's two other components based on a, a model that's been in use for a couple of decades. That it's exhaustion, it is cynicism. So in other words, just I don't care. 
I don't care about you, I don't care about this. You know, who likes working around the person who's always negative all the time? God, I'm glad nobody raised their hand. <laughs> God, oh yeah, but it, it's, it's a drain on you, it's a drain on the team, it's a drain on, uh, oh, forgot I had that on. They're so tiny, the lav mics. Um, but the, it, it becomes a trap of negativity. But also, there's an interrelated idea of a sense of ineffectiveness. Do we feel like our work is producing anything? Do we have a purpose? And the solutions to burnout have to tap into all of these things. Like, how discouraging it is it when you're working on a project so close to completion, canceled? Anybody experience that? Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, some friends of mine, and I won't say which studio, but they had one they were working on for five years, and right before it was about to ship, boom, canceled. How demoralizing is that? How ineffective do you feel in your job where all the five years of work, nothing? How negative are you going to feel about your next experience? And also how exhausted. So this is all of the above coming into one. And that's really what burnout is. Now, a couple of things we want to talk about in this is also self-doubt. Self-doubt, unhealthy self-doubt. I mean, if I, in my current physical state, decide I want to go free climb El Capitan, and there's a part of my brain that goes, no, <laughs> no. <laughs> Let's ignore my crippling phobia of heights for a moment and I just couldn't do it physically. That, there are healthy forms of self-doubt, but other forms of self-doubt are unrealistic, and that, be, that produces a sense of inefficacy. So all of this is interrelated. All of the topics that are commonly talked about in terms of the stressors of being in the game space are interrelated and contribute. We can't just focus on one to find solutions. We need to focus on purpose. We need to focus on investment of, in the product. We need to focus on reasonable working hours because your cognitive, your, I know it feels weird. I heard, I heard somebody say, I lose my motivation. You feel like you lose your motivation? Well, most of us. I get weirdly amped after a while, but um, even I have my limits. Because of this, there's another thing called, uh, technical term is allostatic load. Don't have to remember that. But basically, think of a thermostat, okay? Our bodies are remarkably adaptive. Now, if you leave the door open in your house, and it's New England in the winter, your thermostat is gonna start to work overtime. For those of you who may be from outside of the US, New England is cold. <laughs> I'm from the other side of the country in Seattle, so I never heard of this term winterizing your house, but apparently it's a thing. We have rain, they have blizzards. And so your door is open, your heater is going to try and maintain the temperature in your house. So it's gonna kick into high gear and it's gonna do a good job for a while, but it's gonna burn out. Our bodies are no different. And we need to regulate that a little bit better, but once it gets used to it, it's hard to come back down. So we need to have preventative measures as well. And that's what these lovely folks here are going to talk about, how they have maintained success in this industry for as long as they have, and I'm gonna ask everybody to introduce themselves. Un unfortunately, one of our panelists, security at the airport, just unexpectedly long, missed his flight and was unable to be here with us, but he gave me some great written answers that I may be cheating and reading off later. But who are you, what do you do, how long you been doing it? Okay, um, so I'm Kate Edwards, I, uh, I'm a geographer, and I've been in the industry for 26 years. I do culturalization work, which means I help game developers avoid political and cultural mistakes in their content that gets them banned by governments and has consumer uprisings and stuff like that. I did that at Microsoft for 13 years, and I've been self-employed ever since. Um, in my late last 10 years or so in the industry, I've gotten very involved in advocacy issues. I ran the IGDA for five years. Um, as the executive director, I left in 2017, and since then I've been very active in a lot of advocacy issues, including unionization and creating a legal defense fund and things of that nature. You know, you can applaud.
This is already an audience participation panel. If you free, feel free to applaud, you know, spontaneously, you go for it. There you go. Ah, I know where my hecklers are. Uh, so uh, I'm David Ettery. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Spry Fox. And we've made games uh, like Triple Town, Alpha Bear, Bushido Bear, Realm of the Mad Gods, Steambirds. Um, many of y'all have played any of those. And um, yeah, happy to be here. <laughs> I'm Amir Rao. I'm the studio director and co-founder of Supergiant Games. We're an 18-person independent game company here in San Francisco. We made Bastion, Transistor, Pyre, and working on a game called Hades right now. And uh, missing is Tommy Rafenez, who is the CEO of Team Meat. They have some really cool stuff for Meat Boy coming out very soon, I hear. And uh, I'm Dr. B, the clinical director of Take This. Uh, I am not a developer. I'm actually a doctor of clinical psychology. And so for you all, so when have you experienced any of the, any of the things we talked about in terms of like negativity, exhaustion, um, a sense of inefficacy in your work? And how do you deal with it? You want to start? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I guess uh, for me, I view that form of exhaustion as the potentially inevitable outcome of like a passionate uh, point of view on your work. Um, so for me, when I have felt that way, uh, my own my own view on it, looking backwards now, because um, most of this most of this happened much earlier, is that it was like me understanding and learning what my limits were. I had no other way of discovering them, no matter you know if I had come to this panel or not, um, than to work the way I did uh, to find out what I was capable of and where I might break. Um, so in my experience, uh, I worked a lot. Um, I, you know, especially on something like Bastion, I think you know we were living in the living room of a house. We're working all the time, uh, but we were also like kind of young and didn't have anywhere else to be. Um, so uh, I try to be kind to myself in the in the retrospect uh, of of all that stuff. You know, I've definitely pushed myself too hard. I've made mistakes that um, uh, in 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 understanding my own limits. But that's a uh, I think the hard thing about that stuff is. It's a recurring lesson that you end up having to sometimes relearn every time you, uh, every time you might get. I mean, I think we all want to be, I think a lot of us are drawn to this work because we are like passionately consumed by it. Um, and we sometimes want a job that is so creatively fulfilling it does not fit inside 40 hours. Um, and I think that that sometimes leads to the types of things that you're talking about, um, which is sad because it started like from a place of of actual like joy and engagement. So you're talking about basically a constant readjustment of your expectations in in learning from your failures. Yeah. Basically, what I'm trying to say is like I haven't fixed or solved this. Um, <laughs> <laughs> like um, this is like an ongoing part of of you know our lives. You know we don't we you know we're not at a giant company. There isn't someone who's like bringing in tubs of food and implying that we should all be working late. Um, it's it's not that kind of thing. It's a small group of people who are passionately invested. In the, in the work we're doing and um, uh, how much of their life is a part of work is, uh, is a constant exchange based on what's going on in their life and what's going on at work. Um, so I've, I've experienced, I think, two very different forms of burnout, but both pretty nasty. One of them was like way back in, I don't remember, 2011 or 2012 or something, and we had, it was like, it was on Realm of the Mad God, actually, we had for, fairly arbitrary set of reasons, five weeks to make the game way better, or we were screwed. And um, and so I worked 100 hours or more every week for five weeks, and it was just like Amir was saying, and at the end of that it was like, oh, that's, I found my limit. Like I ran all the way up to the edge of the cliff, very nearly threw myself over it, and then thankfully pulled back and was like, I'm never doing that again. Like I was a broken shell of a human at the end of that five week period. Um, and then the other kind of burnout is very different, but just as nasty. And it's the when you work on something, even if you you know um, 
you know, you work on it for reasonable hours and, you know, n not more than 40 hours a week and everything's hunky-dory, but then you ship it and it fails. And particularly if it fails for reasons that you feel like were not in your control, which is something that's going to happen a lot in games. Like, you'll look at it and you'll be like, I did my best, my game is good, it still didn't succeed, which is like a super common story. Um, like, every time that happens, and thankfully it hasn't happened too many times, but when it does, you just feel the life sucked out of you. And for, there's a period of time where you're like, why am I doing this, you know? And it happens to you even if you have made, like I am very lucky, and I use the word luck very intentionally. Like yeah, I work hard and all that stuff, but like, but like to have as many successful games as BIPOX has had requires a lot of luck um, in addition to skill and sweat and all that. And, um, and it doesn't matter, like I have, even with all the number, like the, you know, I think we have like five games that have been played by several million people, like, and, and it doesn't matter, when a game fails, it's, you still take it super personally. And it's like, and it makes you wanna quit. So yeah, those are my two burnouts. Well, I think from my perspective, because my job has been a little different, I mean, I have, I've been involved in crunch episodes with different teams, but because I'm more of an advisory role to a lot of these teams, I have a choice whether to crunch or not. When I created my geopolitical team at Microsoft to handle this kind of work, I made sure that my team never worked ridiculous hours, even though at the time Microsoft was kind of insisting on pretty long hours for different teams, especially if you're like a core programming team. And I just said that we don't work that way here. I'll take the heat for it, but my people, you go home. So, um, but a lot of my burnout, well, let me ask this question. How many people here consider themselves an introvert? Of course, yeah, we're the game industry. So I do, I do too. I mean, I, I, can, I can take Myers-Briggs or whatever else and it always comes out an I something. Um, I can fake extroversion really well now. But um, one of the biggest challenges I always had in my career was people burn out. Um, it's, it's dealing with people, and I'm not saying it's just because they're incompetent, not everyone's incompetent, but there's people who just have different visions or they pull you in a different direction or um, they are incompetent. There's those people too, <laughs> let's face it. Um, and it's just having to deal with that kind of pressure of being in an organization. So I guess part of it is what I face a lot is organizational burnout. It's like being in this organization that might be dysfunctional. Even though you love your function, you love what you do, you love whatever job you're doing, but you just, the organization you're in, just, ugh, it's just you wish it could be better in multiple attempts with management and all that, just don't, don't make it better. Um, and so I find over, when I look back over my career, that's usually, all the inflection points I've had where I've left a company or you know, done something different, made a major shift, was always because of a uh, interpersonal thing. It was always because either the organization burned me out, like Microsoft, the work that I did at Microsoft, I love my work. I've been doing it for 30 years now and I, and I still love it every day. I got tired of doing it there for many reasons. And so I'm just like, I have to get out of here. I have to do you know, something else, do it somewhere else. Um, and so that, that's often been the case for me, is you just kind of reach this point where it's like, I can't do it here anymore. Um, you hit walls and everything. Um, you know, and there's, along with that comes emotional burnout too. Um, it's like when I created this geopolitical team, it took me seven months. I wrote a proposal because we had this big incident happen in Korea, and it inspired me to create this team. I had to shop it around to five different VPs before I finally got approval, and every one of those rejections was very difficult. I'm like, why can't they understand this is a great idea? Um, then finally, the last VP who approved it, approved it in five minutes, and that's because he was not from the US. He's the only VP I talked to who was not from the US. He's from South Africa, and he's, his first answer was, well, I thought we're doing this already. So he just like, he's like, yes, we need to do this. So I think for me, it's, it's less, I've had less of the physical burnout episodes, but much more of the, the interpersonal, organizational kind of burnout episodes that have been pretty trying at times. Well, and it's interesting for me to think about uh, all the, the different positions that you all have, because uh, one of the things uh, that Tommy said when he answered this question via email was that he's never really experienced burnout the way we described it in that model. And I wonder how much of that has to do with literal ownership of the work. Um, you know, David and Amir, you, you're both in positions where the work truly is yours. I mean, you're both speaking about passion to this and you know Kate you you're a consultant that is a very different position where the people you can say all the amazing things you want but they could choose or not to listen kind of like the original Jurassic Park 
Absolutely. No, seriously. Yeah, no, the, yeah. the technical consultant on the original Jurassic Park, Dr. Jack Horner, is a big proponent of the idea that the Tyrannosaurus Rex is not a hunter, but a scavenger, largely based on its anatomy. That would have been a boring movie. <laughs> But, you know, you're in a position where they can take or leave your suggestion. So all three of you are in very unique positions. What would you say to those who don't have your positions about this? Well, Easy I, question, right? Well, I think that, I mean, just my view is that, that that just doubles down on the stress. I mean, when you, if you have some level of agency in the work that you do, like in my case, it's like I consult, and if they don't like what I said or they're not going to do what I say, I'm just like, good luck. You know, it's in writing that I told you so. So when you do screw up, not when, but when you do, because I know you will, because you didn't listen to me, um, you will get banned in this country. You will have this huge uprising on Twitter. Um, you know, you can come back and just say, you know, we're sorry, we didn't listen to you. But it, but that's hard. That's very hard because um, I want them to succeed. My whole job is to help them succeed, and so that adds a lot of stress on me. I get emotional stress from it. I feel stressful for them. And if that happens frequently, which it doesn't, but it can, you know, we have multiple, you know, things like that happen. You just that's burnout. You're just like, maybe I should just go take like an easy job somewhere. I could just like be a program manager on Marvel, so maybe I can meet Chris Hemsworth someday or something. Or, <laughs> I don't know. So I I am um, I I think this is I'm going to give an answer to basically two questions here. Uh, one of the things that I've noticed that helps me tremendously with burnout is. Um, is making sure that I love the people who I work with. It makes an enormous difference. Um, it doesn't matter how crappy the world is and how, much, how many things are going wrong. If I trust and care about the people who I'm with, it's kind of like, well, we're all in this together. Like, we'll make it work, right? And even if we don't make it work, like, you know, we care about each other, we'll figure this out. Um, I realize, and so that, 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 that's an interesting question you were going to ask later, like, how, um, but... Um, I think that this is a, like, I understand that I'm privileged. Like, I literally get to pick who I work with because I, the, the person who runs the company. But, but I, I do feel like when I talk to my friends who are not in that position, that they oftentimes underestimate their ability to, to get themselves out of situations where they're working with people whom they aren't happy being around. Um, and that's actually something that I would really strongly encourage you guys. Like, like, you know, many people are afraid to even go to their manager, for example, and tell them, like, I'm not happy around this person. Like, and there's so many reasons you could be not happy. It's not like it could be that they're a terrible human being, sure. Like, and 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 that happens. But and it could also be other things. It could just be subtle things. Like, there's a major cultural mismatch. Like, you're constantly feeling friction. Like, you're not being able to settle it yourselves. You know, whatever. Actually, sorry, I should take a step back. If it is something like that, like, talk to that person. Try to work it out. Right. Like, don't just be miserable. Like, that's a that's like a first thing. But like, if you tr have tried that or feel like there's a good reason you can't, like for for example, if that person is a, is a harasser, then yeah, you go to your manager. Like, don't don't just be silently miserable. And if you feel like you can't go to your manager about something like that, like that's a very strong signal you are in the wrong place. Like, you do not belong in a company where you cannot tell your manager that there's another person who, for whatever the reason, makes you not want to go to work. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Um, and if you if you if you make an effort to make sure that you're only working with people who you like and respect, it will make such a huge difference. It it dampens burnout dramatically. Um, and if that means that you need to just be more of a hustler and always be aware of like where your next job might be because the current one isn't the one isn't working out for all the reasons that I just described, then like so be it. You know what I mean? Like hopefully not. Like hopefully eventually you find a place. Like I like to think that the people at Spry Fox feel pretty good about being at Spry Fox. We don't have a lot of turnover. You know? These companies exist. You can find them. Like you owe that to yourself. If you're gonna work this hard for, let's face it, everyone in this room who's making games, there's a very, very high chance you could double your salary in any other industry. Like, very high chance. So if you're gonna work in this industry really hard, like, making less than you could be making anywhere else, possibly longer hours than you'd be working anywhere else, like, you deserve to at least work with people that you like. Yeah. Yeah. I'm trying to let that I'm trying to let that one sink in for a moment because I mean that's that touches on two of the three parts of the burnout model. You're talking about self-efficacy and attachment to an outcome, as well as a lack of cynicism in your work environment. So you're touching on two out of three, and it sounds remarkably protective. That's awesome, Amir. How about you? Yeah, I mean, you know, a late night 
uh, so we made Bash in the living room of my dad's house. Uh, so like a late night there was not a burnout night. It was like a sleepover that lasted for 20 months. Um, so <laughs> it, was, it, it, it was a different feeling because I was there with uh, the woman who had become my wife uh, and uh, you know, my best friends in, in the whole world working on a game together. Um, so that feels really different than if you're in a big team or a big company um, where I, I think one of the things that's really interesting to me about crunch stuff is uh, I think it's pretty rare that someone directly just says, you know, push, push it, like, like do more than you can do. Um, that's almost never the conversation, right? It's usually a little bit more insidious, which is you have way more work than time. People are starting to stay late. They're starting to bring in dinners. Um, these like small telltale signs, leadership is getting anxious and nervous. Well, and that's what we heard from everybody here. Yeah, release date is coming up, these kinds of things. Um, it's all, and, and if you are in a situation even where you love the people you work with, you may feel like a lot of social pressure um, to, to deliver because you don't want to let anyone down, right? Uh, in those scenarios, it can be helpful to think of the difference between when you own the work and when you don't. Uh, because if someone is asking or implying that you should do this, if you're doing it for probably what we could categorize are healthy reasons, like you want to be a part of something, um, you really believe in what's there, you think it's time limited and it's not going to destroy your life, those are maybe some reasons that you can, can use to convince yourself um, to, to put in a little more or whatever, whatever you want. But for the most part, the people who are creating these environments um, are like maybe the only ones who stand to benefit from this. Um, so a lot of people work really hard on things that they later do not see uh, the economic or positive or brand or reputational benefits from that. And that's really, really different. So think about, uh, think about who is gonna benefit from your overwork. Um, because it's a really different equation if it's you and your peers and the people you're connected to and fans that you might love. Um, or a franchise that you might be really, really attached to than uh, like shareholders or um, like the, the executive staff of your corporation who may not even know your name. Um, so it's a really, really, really different uh, sort of setup between those two things. Well, what do you all see? You know, we're men you mentioned, uh, David, you mentioned your privilege in being able to pick your team, and Kate had stories of, you know, way back in the day at Microsoft and the bureaucratic structure that it is. Where do you all see managers, uh, especially like mid level managers? Where is their responsibility in helping to curb the burnout? From my perspective, a manager is is uh, or is a leader, but a, what to lead is to serve, in my view. And if you are in a leadership position, that means you are serving the needs of the people under you. And if you don't see it that way, then you should not be a leader. You should not be a manager. Um, you basically you. It's not a triangle with you at the top. It's you at the bottom, serving the needs of everyone in your organization. So you work for them. And that's, that's really the perspective that you have to see it. And so on that level, you have a fundamental responsibility not only to the job that they're working on so that it's successful, so you're obviously trying to work towards the production and all that kind of stuff, but that also means shepherding their needs and being make, making sure that they're okay on an emotional level, physical level, all these other dimensions of what makes a successful project happen. And, you know, to look just at numbers and just look at a, you know, timesheet of, of what's due, the due dates and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, you gotta do that because that's part of your responsibility. But to me, that's the easy part. You know, the hard part is actually going around and making sure you know the names of everyone on your team and making sure you know what their situation is and making sure you have some level of empathy with the different situations that they're facing because every single person's different. And so, um, so that's one of the things I often really try and encourage people in a leadership role. It's like if you cannot see yourself as a servant and, and as a shepherd, then you're definitely in the wrong job. Yeah, that's great. All right, apparently Kate just dropped the mic on that one. <laughs> just don't drop the mic, they're expensive, okay? <laughs> um, you all talked about mistakes that mistakes are inevitable. And in fact, Amir, you talked about your learning process as a constant recalibration yeah. 
of mistakes in a new environment. What advice do you have for everybody on how to accept the fact that we will make mistakes? And how do they build the resilience to get through them? Yeah, so they're not mistakes. Like, that's the simple answer. Like, how could you have known? Like, there is no way for you to have known how it was gonna affect your life and what was gonna happen to it until you did it. So I would not necessarily uh, view those chapters of your life as a moment where you totally drop the ball on something that everyone already knew um, because everyone's limits are different, everyone's lives are different, all those things are, are unique and personal to the individuals. So if you've experienced uh, some extreme emotional event connected to work or even like a persistent low level uh, nagging uh, emotional event uh, sort of connected to those things, uh, I would be kind to yourself about that because um, the reason I have to keep relearning is because it's popping up in different ways. You know, if it was the exact same thing every time, I would be, uh, I would be much more prepared. Um, <laughs> but uh, but the, way, the way this kind of consumption creeps into your life is, is gonna be different each time and it's probably because it's coming from some place inside you that's, that's like either highly motivated or highly ambitious or highly loyal to the people you work with or whatever those things are, it's probably coming from a place that isn't entirely negative, that isn't just a lack of self-control, an inability to constrain yourself a lack of prioritization, like all the things that we can use to beat ourselves up with. Um, yeah, I just, yeah, it's not a mistake. It's just, it's just how you have to learn. So you're it's talking just, about reframing. Yeah. yeah. I, but it's, I mean, it's central to, it, it is not a coincidence that many of the most successful creative companies, including like the Pixars and stuff of the world, like they are all very, very good at trying to banish the word failure from their company cultures. Like it's not failure, it's just not failure. It's, I mean, there are forms of failure, but they're not the ones that most people think about. Like, if you hire someone and they are just unreliable and mean and whatever, like, you know, bad person attributes for like, I don't know what you would call that. Like, like yeah, those people are failing as far as I'm concerned. And we do everything we can to try to get rid, uh, fortunately, we've actually, I don't think in the history of Sprout, Sprite Fox, we've ever hired someone that was quite that bad. But like, when we hire someone who's even a little bit toxic, like we make an effort to get rid of them quickly. Um, because that's failure, that, that's bad. Aside from that, like if it's a person who's like an intelligent human being who honest, really cares and is honestly trying their best and something goes wrong, it's never failure. It's just they tried their best and it didn't work. And we're super, super hardcore about that. And we've started to entrench that in other aspects of our culture. Like, for example, I, I, um, a little bit of quick background that will help you understand. Spry Fox is kind of weird. Like, we're only 18 people, but we'll have like four games in concurrent development at any given time. Um, and we've been like that since the beginning when we were even a lot less than 18 people. Um, and we do that in part because we have this obsession with making highly creative games. And we know that we're probably like, that's super risky, and some of them are going to fail maybe even a lot of them are gonna fail. And so as a result, you have to be making a lot of them so that at least one of them can succeed and cover the cost of all the failures. Um, but when you do that, like I was saying earlier, like you're pouring yourself into these original expressions and then they fail and it's like a knife in the heart. And so how do you, how do you deal with that? And the way you deal with it is by not causing, calling it failure. Like you celebrate all the things you learned from making that thing. And like we try to be really conscious about that, like where you know a game at the end of it, we'll spend a lot of time talking about like what are all the cool things that we did, and what did we learn from that, and like oh were there any problems? What did we learn from that? And like it's never failure, you know what I mean? It's just growing as a person. Um, I think that's super central. We also recently in our Slack channel added a a, a pyre. Uh, 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 channel for, uh, for a place where like if you're working on a prototype and the prototype ends up not being fun, you like give it its send off there, right? Like, <laughs> like you know, it was a good soldier, it died, <laughs> hooray, on to the next one. Um, and like, and it's just a way of, like again, so that it's not, you didn't screw up. Like the fact that your prototype wasn't fun is not, a, is not on you. Like that's what happens with prototypes. Let's celebrate the fact that this one didn't work out and move on to the next one. You know what I mean? Um, so I think that's actually pretty important. Um, I highly encourage you to, to try to completely reframe your thinking about it. And also, again, 
quite frankly, if you're in a place where that's not where the way people think and they're not willing to think that way, no matter how much you encourage them to, like maybe that's not a good place to be. Like don't don't be at a place where you get browbeaten for trying your best and and it not working out. Um, yeah. So, you know, all of you have touched on this idea of studio culture being important. Like, what's your take home tip for people looking for a good fit for studio culture? Like, what do you look for? Go for it. Yeah, you go for it. All right. <laughs> it's always good when I ask a question, like, ooh. Yeah, well, so, I mean, I can just talk about. I'm going to just answer a different question because, yeah. Um, <laughs> well, that's a, you know what? That's okay. Take the politician's uh, yeah, way out. Yeah. So, yeah, I'll just answer the question I want to answer, um, which is like, what do what do we do um, around around things like this? Like, what do we do to promote like healthy working habits? Because um, so ultimately, it's Supergiant. Uh, here's the thing I'm most proud of about Supergiant: we made really good games. Uh, all the people who worked on Bastion still work there, right? Those are that group is still there. Um, so, for us. Like, uh, sustainably creating like the games we make is like central to what we want to accomplish. So, you know, hopefully we'll be like the Rolling Stones and be like super fricking old, charge like ten thousand dollars <laughs> per game or something when we're like seventy. Um, but um, the the basic idea for us is we end up. Uh, doing things we like hesitated about because we came from EA, so it's like we shouldn't have policies, but actually we need policies. Um, and we especially need policies uh, to save us like from ourselves. Um, so an example of stuff we do at Supergiant, uh, we don't send weekend emails. So like Friday at five to Monday at 5 a.m., there's no emails or Slack messages or anything like that. If there's an emergency, you get a phone call and there are emergencies. Um, and so you don't have to worry about checking. You know you can turn it off, that's it. Uh, we used to have unlimited time off, and then no one took time off. Um, so we have a mandatory minimum 20 days off, and you can take more. Um, so the idea is we have the kind of culture where people need to be reminded to leave. Um, and so we made a policy around that. Um, and then we have like really liberal kind of like work from home type of policies because we want like work-life balance is something that comes up a lot. I, for some reason, I chafe at that phrase because it makes it sound like there is a perfect state that you can achieve in which your work and life are like perfectly just in it, like together. Um, for me, we, we try to talk about like work-life integration. Um, how, how does work contour to your life? Like how can it fit into your life? And in any reasonable human company that's trying to sustain itself, that will change like almost every year. Um, so uh, in terms of a culture, you know, work contours to your life is a central part of our culture. Um, and we end up inventing all these small ways um, to promote healthy habits for ourselves as a result. And the only reason we can make those is because we did the opposite and didn't work. Um, so we had to learn it over time. Yeah. So we, we, um, we had, um, we've done some similar stuff where, uh, for example, we, we say y you should not work weekends. And, and sometimes, like you said, there's emergencies and people will have to work weekends. But we explicitly say, and by we I mean Daniel and I, the co-founders, that like if someone is working on a weekend, there is a very high chance that that means Daniel and I fucked up. Like we take that on ourselves, and like and we encourage everyone who works in Sprite Fox to feel free to call us out on that too. Like if someone's like, I worked eight hours on Saturday, you suck, Dave. Like, like, like that's a good thing, right? Because it decreases the odds that I'm, I mean, it decreases the likelihood that I will then put them in that situation again in the future because I don't like being told I suck. So, 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 so there's that. And we also have, we have a, a, a challenge that Supergiant doesn't, which is that we're spread all over the world. So this has made it super hard to have like boundaries around work and, and life because it's like, I have people who are in South Africa. They're messaging me at hours that I would rather not be messaged. Um, but I don't want them to have to work with crazy hours, so I will accept those messages. And like, it, it's a thing, and it's complicated, and honestly, there's no good answer to that. It's very messy, but what, so what we've tried to do to solve for that, aside from the like, please don't work on weekends, so at least I'm not getting the insane 2 a.m. message on Saturday, um, is, is please be respectful and ask folks like, how they feel about being messaged at any given time. Like, we have people on the team who, feel very, very, very strongly that they should not be bothered in Slack on a Saturday or Sunday for any reason. 
And so I know who those people are. And like we now have a culture in the studio where like if I'm like trying to inv like use their name but I don't want to bother them, I'll we'll, like for Brent, like we'll write, we'll do B dash rent in Slack so that he does not get a ping, you know? And everyone in the studio knows this. And you'll see like on the weekends when people are, like the few people who are bothering to write something on the weekends, like they're all dashing names. And it's great because it's like a conscious and very clear cultural sign that like we respect people's boundaries. Um, that's probably one of my favorite things that has happened organically in our, in our Slack channel. Um, so it's just, just a thing, like you just have the open conversations about it. There are people in the group that like, they actually, like for them it's actually more important to be able to take like Friday off. Like, they actually want to spend a few hours on Saturday and, like, take all of Friday off. And it's like, okay, you can do that, but, like, you're going to do the hyphen thing on the weekend when you are working. Like, you're not bothering the rest of us. Don't, like, don't ruin our lives with your choices. And, <laughs> like, and it works for the most part. Like, it's messy. Again, I'm not going to pretend that this is, like, perfect. There are definitely times where, like, there's some friction, but it works okay. Well, I know from the other side of the coin, how many people here are freelance by choice? Okay, so there's some of us here. Yeah, not a lot of us, but there's some of us. So for, for those of us who are freelance or consultants or in that, in that role that we're not working in a company, but we choose to work with different companies, oftentimes we choose because we need to pay a rent or, we, or a mortgage or whatever. So a lot of times it's hard for us to turn down work because we want the work, obviously, but there are times over my career where I have turned down jobs from, from certain clients because the, either the project that is being brought to me is something that I don't want to work on, it's just the content is something I don't want to associate with, um, or the company just has a really bad reputation for how it treats its people, and those are really hard decisions to make because you're just like, oh, I really could use this contract, but you know, it, it's trying to take the high road and kind of reinforce these are my values, and, and the thing is I do communicate that to them. Now maybe that burns a bridge with them, but if that's the way they are, I really don't give a shit. So, you know, I, maybe I don't want to work with them again. So, um, but I do think it's important to not only make that decision, but to communicate why. You know, why am I choosing not to take you this work that I desperately need? Because you are doing this, and I know this, and this, and this. You know, and you can make all the excuses, but I've talked to your employees or whoever, and it's pretty clear that you've got a messy situation. And so I don't want to kind of reinforce that, basically help make you successful on the back of people who are being, you know, treated uh, un really unfairly. So, um, but that's hard. I mean, it's really hard in the consultant role or a freelance role to, to turn away stuff like that, but we have to be very conscious of it. And the other part of that, oftentimes, pretty much every freelancer I know, you know, we don't have someone in management giving us holidays. We don't have anyone telling us to go home at night. We don't have any of that because we're basically in our home office just heads down doing this. And oftentimes we're doing it, of course, because we absolutely love what we do. Hopefully we do. If we don't, then we shouldn't be doing it. But um, that's really hard. And so I know for me, it's, it's been really tough over the last 14 years after I left Microsoft to really discipline myself to stop working. You know, actually, like a policy when I'm home, I travel a lot to speak at events, but when I am home in Seattle, I, like Saturday is usually just my day. I just, I don't do anything other than just go out, you know, you know, get some air, you know, do whatever, maybe, you know, clean the house a little bit. Just, you know, don't do work. And so I try and do that kind of thing for myself. And But even that's been really hard to discipline. So I think it's a, uh, in, when you're in that role, it's just, it's tough. And you really have to find that self-discipline. And, and if you have to, get other people around you to hold you accountable to it. I do want to quickly, um, I, it's something that occurred to me belatedly that I do want to emphasize. Everything that, in particular, that Amir and I were talking about, oh, sorry. everything that Amir and I were talking about, in particular, um, is predicated on what I was saying earlier, which is we, we like and trust the people we work with and vice versa. Like, so much of what we've been talking about would break down if we worked with assholes. Um, so I, I think that's something you, re I'm going to repeat it because I think it's so important. Like, you, this is really something you have to take to heart. Like, you, you know, there's this mythos and uh, this, this mythology in Silicon Valley and in games of like, well, there's, there's that amazing programmer who's like 10 times more effective than any other programmer, but he's also an asshole, but it's okay because he's 10 times better than any other programmer and he's gonna make our game amazing. And so like, you, yes, you want people like that. No, I, I think that's bullshit. You well, don't want people like that. And that seems that. pretty consistent across the board. Like um, almost everybody I've ever spoken with ha has said universally, I will 
I would prefer a middle of the road employee who's a delight to work with versus you know some diva who comes in and says, yeah, I want my desk to be filled with 1,000 brown M&Ms every day as yeah, I, yeah. Yeah. I go I mean, in. And if there's one blue, I quit. Yeah, I mean, think about it. Like, you can't have a, um, a, a policy where people are required to take at least 20 days of vacation unless you trust those people, right? That they're not gonna abuse that, that they're people worthy of that. You can't have a situation where you know, where you expect everyone to do the hyphen thing in Slack and not bother each other unless, like, they're people who actually care and would, would internalize something like that. Like, that just stops working otherwise. Like, so, yeah, Ch choose who you work with carefully. And so that, that, it's, that seems to be an ongoing theme here is that the team makes a difference and the team helps build the connection. But on top of that, in terms of studio managers, you, because of the amount of discipline it takes to take time off when you're really passionate about this. And it is, it does take a lot of discipline and it's really helpful to have people who bug you to take time off. I don't know this from personal experience at all. <laughs> I've literally been ordered to take a vacation two weeks from now. Um, <laughs> My boss is laughing at this because she's the one who made me do it. But, um, <laughs> but um, you're talking about implementing studio policies to make people realize that working less to a degree makes them work more effectively and keeps your employees. And one of the signals, Amir, you look for in things is turnover rate sure. in terms of a good studio environment. So lightning round, because I want to cu cut to questions for a few minutes. Um, think about your questions now. Begin them with a who, what, where, why. Not story time. <laughs> um, what would you want to tell yourself, your earlier career self, about how to make your career last? And Tommy replied with the very colorful, only be loyal to those who are loyal to you and lawyer the fuck up. <laughs> wow. <laughs> wow. Well, my, my answer would be very simple. Um, one of the things, uh, Mark Twain, he once expressed, the, it's been said in many ways, but he, he wrote that comparison is the death of joy. And uh, if I could have told myself that, even when I was 10 years old or 15 or whatever, that would have changed my life tremendously. I am very thankful for where I am. I have no regrets about all my different pasts, but thinking about others and where they are and how good they are or bad they are, any of that, and around this issue of, of stress and, and burnout and everything, I hear it all the time when I talk to developers. The one huge massive layer of stress is that they're looking on social media, looking on Facebook and Twitter, and they're going to this conference in Dubrovnik, and they're going over here, and, and here I am in my shithole still working, and I'm depressed, and I'm angry and this game's not working and I can't get the build going, all that kind of stuff. And I think that layer of pressure is just like you're at the bottom of the ocean and it's just you have to just stop comparing yourself to what other people are doing around you and just focus on what you do best, focus on your work, you know, and you know, just and especially one of the things I see a lot is when people say, I will never be as good as them. I, I'm never I'll never be as good of an artist or programmer or whatever. You know, and if you see people like that around you, whether it's in your studio, at school or whatever, guess what? You just found a mentor. Go ask them to help you to, to get better at what you're doing. But that that I think for me would be a fundamental difference if I had just mind my own business and focus on what I do best. No comparisons, find a mentor. Yes. Awesome. Oh, Lord. Um, so uh, I would say the, the stuff I look back on and feel the worst about are the times when overwork might have affected my relationship or my relationship. So probably something like, you know, uh, tell Anna that you love her and that you're grateful for her. Um, you know, I'm, we're, we're married, everything's good. Um, <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, certainly that's, that's the stuff I look back on and, and it's like, man, she, she lived in the house with us. She like was there the whole time. Um, and uh, she cooked for us, she did all sorts of things that lifted our spirits and made Bastion possible. So, uh, you know, I've, I've said it a lot since then, but I should have said it more then. So tell those you care about that you love them. Okay. I mean, I've been, I've been pretty lucky. I, I, um, there's an 
not a whole lot that I would have told myself to do differently 10 years ago, aside from, and you guys can guess this, from the multiple things I've already said, like, there's a handful of people I kind of wish I would have separated myself from sooner. You know, people who were, like, just not awesome people, and by awesome, I, I don't, don't mean they weren't the greatest artist or programmer ever, I mean, they were just not nice people. They were just very selfish, or very this, or very that, and, like, they made my life worse, and as soon as they were out of my life, my life got 10x better. <laughs> so we've got about three and a half minutes for questions, and there are microphones right here. But the good news is we will be hanging out in one of the wrap-up rooms afterwards if you have more questions that don't get asked. So come on up to the microphone, give us your quick question, and we'll see what we can answer. Hey. Ian Schreiber, RIT. Uh, many people here are students, faculty, or people who mentor them. Uh, for at the student level, um, there are some people in higher ed that say that take the thing of we need to teach how to take care of yourself, how to work in a safe and sane way. There are others that say, well, lots of parts of the industry suck. A lot of these students are going to go to Crunchy Studios. We need to prepare them for it. How would you find the balance between those things? So, how do you teach students the balance between hard work and sustainable work? Well, the, how do you balance? The, um, the fact that industry is going to have some crunchy studios that students will go to and you are, and our part of our role is to prepare students for that eventuality mm -hmm. versus you know, not burning our students out before they even get to industry. So how do you prepare students for the reality of the industry as it is while teaching them to try and be better? Yes. Okay. That's a great question. <laughs> <laughs> And you all have answers to this, concrete ones, well, yeah, right? I mean, I've, I've actually been in law, involved in a lot of educational programs, especially in Europe, and um, one of the things that some of them have done is try and model, you know, they basically model themselves after a studio, an ideal studio, you know, so they try and model that behavior to the students in the process of education so that they can take that model and, and send, bring that expectation to their employer. One of the things I've also been mentoring a lot of students about is that when you go into a job interview, you must be asking those questions about, about what's the work life like? Do you crunch here? What's your diversity numbers? All of that kind of stuff. Because, you know, you, you know and, you, and not only ask the question, but be willing to walk away if the question is not what you want to hear. That is super tough and it takes courage to walk away from your first job, but I've heard some students who've done it and they felt instantly empowered because now I have a choice. I wasn't desperate. And I think we have to encourage students to be able to do that and make that choice for their own benefit. Thank you. So in other words, teach students to ask good questions, training programs need to model the ideal. Yes. Cool. I, I, oh, I'm gonna add one thing to that, which is that, because I, like, I, I agree with that, and then at the same time, I know, because it's just the reality of life, that there's gonna be a bunch of young people out there who are gonna feel like they only have one job offer, yep. and they've spent the last four years trying to get into the game industry, you better believe they're gonna take that job offer. That this is like, even if it, they're going into a studio that they know crunches 24 seven. So given that, I guess what I'd say, and I realize this is hard, because like 90% of this room is introverts, and I'm a secret introvert too, so I get it. Um, <laughs> is like, you just have to always be networking. Like, you have to make an enormous effort to make sure that you meet other people, that you get your name out there, that you have eventually other options. Because yeah, you might find yourself feeling like you're being forced to take a job at a place that has an unhealthy culture in some way, shape, or form. And I'm not gonna judge you for doing that. Like, if you feel like you really have to do that to break in, so be it. Like, do that. I mean, I worked like, an, like a mule when I was in my 20s. I mean, I'm not going to criticize anyone for that, but like the reason I'm not still doing that is because I forced myself out of my box and that worked more than I thought was physically possible. Um, you know, because again, secret introvert. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So, um, we just got the call for time. Where is the meetup room for further questions? 204. Okay, we will be in room 204, but thank you all.